how are we doing today? My name is Trisha and I am here to sketch a little bit with you. Let's see. So I have under, under my microscope right now a cogwheel assassin bug, but that doesn't have to be uh, the insect that we sketch. I figured um, once we had one or two people here that we would be able to kind of, um, that we would be able to chat about it a little bit and kind of pick an insect together so that we can sketch together. And I know that we're just a couple minutes early, so I wanted to just open it up, make sure everything was running all right. So, story time before we get all set up. Um, let's see. All right, you can see my hand. All right, so <coughs> we're going to be um, sketching a little bit today, and I am left handed as you can see. Um, and so I'll be sketching, except that I accidentally got a little boo boo yesterday. I was using a mandolin slicer and took off the top of my finger. So, um,. And my sketches might be a little off today, but I'm still excited to be pl to be practicing with you. Perfect. Well, we have somebody here. Do we have an idea as to what we would like to sketch today? I think I might just start sketching this cogwheel assassin bug, and then when Akshay or um, people get here that that want to kind of vote on what we're drawing, then we can move on. I think. So. This is my cogwheel assassin bug to the right. We might as well write that out. All right, and cogwheel assassin bugs. Let me really quick look up. I think it's Aristitis, Aristitis. Chrysalis. Aurilus Christatus. All right. And then its scientific name, Aurilus Christatus. And I just like to start that at the top of the page just so that we kind of know what we're working with. Um, feel free. My name is Miss Trisha. I am an entomologist. I'm Trisha. I'm an entomologist and I love checking out insects under my microscope. Feel free to grab a paper and pencil um, and sketch along with me while we while we check out this assassin bug. All right. So I figure we might as well start at what we're looking at right now. So um, if we are looking at around this area right here, that's actually our head. Let's see. I'm Trisha. I'm an entomologist. I want to make sure that I can see our chat box. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So um, we might as well start sketching at the head. Ha! I left the red dot on his eye. Um, so the head's up here, and if you look right pretty much where that red dot was, that is where its compound eye is. We're going to start right there at that suture, right there at that line above the eye. Um, I generally like to start at the heads. Um, and so while we're sketching, we're going to follow that line, go ahead and pull in that eye, and then we're going all the way around. 
Now this is one of the insects that we call a true bug, meaning that it is in the order Hemiptera and that it has a piercing and sucking mouth part. And so this is kind of, this is the head and then after at this point, moving backwards, this is actually the mouth part. Um, and we're going to see that this mouth part is long and kind of segmented. When we flip this specimen over, you'll see that it, um, this mouth part continues up until a very, very sharp point. And they can kind of stab their prey, inject like venom, and drink them. Kind of like a bug slurpee. Alright, so we're going to finish off this head. This head does narrow a little bit at the base and then when it hits the, when it hits the thorax or the pronota, meaning the first segment of the thorax, it pulls out a little bit and gets this, gets kind of wider. Now, um, the first segment of the thorax is also where the first leg comes off. All right, so if we're looking at, this is the side of the pronotum, the side of the first segment, and we're coming down here and just kind of finishing up this part. Um, this first segment right off of its body is kind of like its hip, and we call this segment the coxa. All right, if you want to pluralize that, you can add an E. And then moving up, um, because our legs are um, our legs are longer, so they're going to come up and kind of block off a little bit of the head, and that's fine. All right, the next segment we know that insects have exoskeletons, and so those exoskeletons do not have the ability to bend unless there are joints. So anytime you see an insect's body part moving or um, sh are shifting from one place to another, antenna that bend, legs that move, wings that flap, um, those are all connected to more like ligament tissues, more um, things that have joints, right? So anywhere where my insect bends, it needs a joint. Now, this next one is kind of funny because it's kind of like the first segment of a human's leg. They call it the femur, right? And then the second segment of a human's leg, right, if we were talking about after the knee, between the knee and the ankle, we have a tibia, right? And so do insects. So. This is going to be our tibia. It tends to be fairly long and slender. My cat's making all of the noises. He wants all of the attention. Now, this side of my insect's body is actually missing its tarsi. Um, it looks like those kind of fell off at some point. Um, so we are going to have to focus on another leg to show you what those tarsi look like. Let's get that happening. So I can go ahead and deactivate my camera so that we can move this guy around. We're going to flip him to the other side. This side has all of the tarsi. Cool. All right, so um, we flipped him over, but we can kind of imagine he's still in the same general direction. Um, we have our tibia out there, and it almost looks like there's kind of an extra nodule that we didn't see on the other side, so we can add that, and then go ahead, and I'm going to show you with this little dot. These two little guys right there at the very end of its leg, those are called its tarsi, all right? Kind of like humans have metatarsals or little toes. Um, cogwheel assassin bugs and all other insects, they have tarsi. A lot of times tarsi are almost triangular shaped, so I like to come out kind of narrow at the base and wider at the end, and then kind of do it, um, and sometimes you have to kind of stack them, kind of like this, before you've got the end. 
Um, but this insect in particular just has the one segment and then the question is, is there two tarsal hooks or just one? There are two. All right, so this insect has two tarsal claws. So we're going to be running the second segment that's kind of longer, and it, he's got two claws on the end of it. Very cool. So um, that's going to be our first leg. So we have a little bit of the head and the pronotum. Now that we're zoomed out a little bit, I think that we can see the antenna well enough too. So we might as well connect those in. Um, we can see that the eye is right about here, the mouth part's right about here. So those antenna are touching the head. Um, those antenna are touching the head probably in like this general vicinity. And if we can see these, these antennal segments, whereas they look like they're, um, it almost looks like it's elbowed, but this is, these are, uh, long, straight, thin antenna. Um, they don't have very many segments, and that's why this guy looks so long, because that is all one segment, so that cannot bend. Um, so we have the first segment that is incredibly long and thin and, and, and straight, it should be, it should be straight, ha. Huh. Okay, um, so we have that first segment, and then from here to about here, we have our second segment, it's about half the length of the first one. All right, and then it looks like from that angle to right about here, Maybe there's a maybe there's a segment here. Let me check on a microscope really fast. Yeah. So there's a segment right here at the leg. So it looks like these segments one, two, three are all about the same length. One, two, three, and then a little fourth one at the end that's about half that length. All right, and so that's about what our antenna look like. Now keep in mind that each one of these segments you want to leave straight, but um, it's artist's choice as to how you want these antenna to bend as long as they bend at the joints. So you see I had this last one come out a little bit just because I know that there's going to be something coming out here. All right, so we've got our head, our eye. I'm gonna fill the eye in just a little bit. There. Um, we have our head and our eye. We have the first leg, the antenna, the mouth parts that are actually going to be coming up underneath the body. All right, and let's check out the second segment of our thorax really quick. This is where it gets really interesting. All right, so we had our first segment, and our first segment was um, pretty... Our first segment right here, that's pretty like, that's pretty smooth. But once you get to that second segment, check that out. We actually have this large wheel-like structure on the top of our insect. It's a defensive mechanism. It makes them look scary. Um, these guys are venomous. Their bites do hurt. They, hi. Hi, Akshay, how you doing? So I figured that we would kind of start with the wheel bug, the cogwheel assassin bug, just because I was here solo for a couple minutes. Um, would you like to continue with this guy? I can kind of give you the, I can give you the uh, overview of what we've sketched so far. Um, or you can pick your own bug. What do you think? Yeah, 
yes, let's keep going. Awesome. So this is my cogwheel assassin bug. Oryllus cristatus is the um, is the scientific name for this insect. Um, we've looked at a couple of viewpoints, but here we've got the um, yes, good. We have the head and we're moving into the thorax. So this head right here, you can see that its mouth part is coming backwards. And this one is venomous. So you want to make sure that you don't get bit by this one. Um, they are predatory. And I was actually collecting one time and these guys were covering a gas station wall. At least a hundred, maybe two. Uh, Cogwheel assassin bugs were all in the same white wall. It was kind of crazy. So we have this first leg, and we talked about how, like, the coxy is this first kind of hip-like segment, and then humans have both a femur and a tibia, um, the femur being the bone between our hip and our knee, and the tibia being that bone between our knee and our toes. Insects are the same, which makes me really happy. They've got this femur that moves up into a knee area and then a tibia afterwards. So that's cool. Now we're moving back towards the second segment of the thorax where the where the actual wheel starts. And this wheel is what gives our assassin bugs their name. All right. My hemiptera is going to get in the way, so I'm going to erase that. But that's the order in which this insect is in. This insect is in the order hemiptera. So we're coming through. And I just want to try and here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it and then I'm just going to give myself a baseline as to kind of where the, where the wheel goes. It's heavy on the front and it's kind of lighter on the back. And then when I come back, I'm going to come back and add those spines. That'll make it a little easier. All right, and we want to make sure that so there's this angle happening because of the because the way that the wings are going to happen, so the ways are the way that the wings are going to connect in here, because you um, the first segment here it's more like this. Yes. All righty. All right, now I'm gonna go back in and add these and add these spines onto our wheel. And they're not all even, so that doesn't make it super easy to sketch, but I feel like it gives us a rough idea. And then it looks like closing in on the end of the wheel, the, uh, the spines get smaller and narrower. And there is a little bit of variety, there is definitely variety in the wheels in different species of cogwheel assassin bugs. So if yours isn't perfect or isn't exactly like the picture shown, that's okay because the variety in those wheels is probably enough to kind of cover anything that's not exactly 100% accurate. Um, and so we're going to go in and this is about where our second segment is and then it looks like we're going to have one more. And so when we're working with a thorax, your thorax always has three segments. And in each third of our thorax, we have a pair of legs, right? Because insects have six. Um, this leg is actually coming out towards the camera a little bit, but something that you should know is that insects, generally their first legs point forward, and then their second and third pair of legs actually are going to point backward. So you'll notice that as you're watching insects walk around, um, that that's going to be pretty common with most insects. And we have the same number of segments, the coxa, the femur, the tibia, and then let's... Oh, which part is, of the thorax is the cogwheel section? 
So, um, the cogwheel section starts over top of this second segment. Um, but this is a really interesting thing because a lot of times the, um, the first segment can be enlarged or swollen and they call it a pronotum because it's a kind of a shield. Um, in cockroaches, for instance, the pronotum or that shield on the first segment goes forward and protects the head. So you can't see a cockroach's head from above. You have to flip them over. Um, with cogwheel assassin bugs, technically this wheel is connected to the first segment. It's an expanded pronotum, but it doesn't really start, the actual wheel part doesn't start until about the, about the second segment. So this line really can be erased. The, the, um, the cogwheel is an expansion of the first segment, but if you're talking about, like, for sketching purposes, um, the cogwheel starts on the second third. Good question. And if you want to look up fun pronotum uh, expansions, go look up membracity. Um... Um, yeah. Okay. And then, oh, we're going to move, we're going to move our specimen a little bit so that we can see its leg. Exactly. Tree hoppers have super cool pronotums. Um, <clears throat> they have, uh, if you look at the, like the rainforest ones, it looks like they just have all types of crazy hairdos. And I really don't know what the purpose is of, like, all of the wild. I know that some embracids, some tree hoppers, they will have, um, some tree hoppers that uh, feed on like roses will actually be shaped as a spine so that they can kind of hide within the thorns, which is kind of cool. So there are like um, membracids that only like feed on rose that are shaped like rose thorns. Um, but that makes sense to me because you're kind of hiding within the environment. The ones that have like wild expansions and little balls at the end and like they look like they could be antlers, those don't really make as much sense to me. All right. All right. So, um, we're seeing our second leg. So you can tell kind of at the end of that tibia right there, um, it's just a little bit expanded, and I think that that is a part of the leg, not another segment. But we saw that on the first one, too, that it was just a little bit expanded. And then two segments. The first one, and then the second one that's kind of elongated with two tarsal claws at the end. I need to stop sketching where my bug is on move to. All right. So we have our cogwheel. Very good. All right. Moving back into the abdomen. Oh, this is going to be cool because you're going to be able to see the spiracles. Just a little fast side note, this little itty bitty circle right there, 
That's the spiracle, and I believe he has a spiracle on pretty much every one of these abdominal segments, just this leg is in the way. But you can see that little itty bitty guy right there, that is a sclerotized ring that's actually open all the way into the insect's body, and he is able to breathe through that. He um, uses, uh, yeah, he just opens them kind of like windows, and the air moves in and out of his body. And then when they molt, when they shed their exoskeletons, they actually shed also the um, some of the inner linings of their breathing system. So when you, like, see an insect's molt, and there's all of these little, what look like little white hairs on it, those are actually the spiracles and, like, the tracks inside of their body that help them breathe. Um, so that's kind of cool. It's what you get when you're hanging out with me. Random side notes. Okay. So there's a couple of things that we can notice here. Let me get our friend all focused. Because we're kind of finishing up the last segment of the thorax and, or last segment of the thorax and moving into the abdomen, right? Because we have this right here, the connection to, the connection to um, its leg is in the, is on the third segment of the, of the thorax. All right. So that's very much this right here. This right here is the coxa. And that's the hip bone. The hip bone's connected to the femur bone. All right. And this insect's femur, you can see, is incredibly long. We've got to zoom out maybe a little bit so I can show you the whole leg. This leg reaches the distance and actually past the abdomen. So if you're like me and running out of paper space, you're not going to be able to draw the entire hind leg or maybe we'll have to or maybe I'll have to move to another piece of the paper. Um <coughs> <coughs> So I'm going to be kind of giving them this super super long femur and maybe yeah, maybe what I'll do is I'll make it kind of angled up more so that I can at least fit the tibia there. And hopefully it doesn't look too much like a grasshopper. Yeah, that's fine. So, um, coxa femur tibia. And then we're looking at this kind of wild situation where the pronotum or the first segment of the thorax is hitting the last segment of the thorax and the abdomen and we have these wings here. There's a lot of going on. Oh, and let me help you spell spiracles. Like respire. All right, so our wings, um, the base of our first pair of wings is right here. Generally, the rule of thumb, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult to see on this guy, but here's the rule of thumb. The first pair of wings connects to the first segment, and the second pair of wings connects to the second segment. Now, with this pronotum expanding all the way over its body, where the wings are connected is kind of hidden underneath that. Um, so we're not, that's not something we're able to see. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start our wing connection pretty much right here where, it, where the second segment comes through. That's where our wings are going to start. And I just want to make sure that the leg stays on top of the wing. There we go. All right. Now, there's something crazy also, there's something wild that happens with our um, abdomen, and that is that there's this, um, <laughs> no problem, there is this angle right here. 
Um, this is an angle where the actual abdomen is expanded up and past its wings. So we can see the wings a little bit, but then the abdomen kind of expands up through. If we're looking at it from a partic from a specifically ventral view, right? So um, this is where our wings are connected, and we can even give this a little triangle because there are two pairs of wings connecting here. Um, but this is this right here is the abdomen kind of expanding over, and then we get there. We go. We get a little bit of an abdomen, and then. We get segments. So a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times with segments, um, at the very edges, I like to almost square them off because I feel like it looks, it makes them look more realistic. So I always tuck the next segment just inside of the last one. Um, it gives it this ridged look. Um, and that's how a lot of insects work anyway, is if they're moving and flexing their abdomen, um, the segments further away from the thorax, they kind of tuck in and they can, and they can shift and that's how they move. Um, all right. But we also have this kind of here. We have a series, we have our series of spiracles, and those are actually probably even smaller than that. We have our series of spiracles, and those are going to be underneath that expansion, and they're going to run along, and they're going to be on pretty much every segment on the abdomen, all the way up to the end. Um, my friend ran out of space. That's fine. <laughs> all right. Um, doop, 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 doop. Let's move to the back. See what we're missing. All right. So at the end, this um, this angle from the abdomen. Very cool. This angle from the abdomen that comes up and then reaches back down um, does come all the way down and meets the wings at the end. Um, so maybe what I'll do, you're totally going to laugh at me, but you know, maybe what I will do, uh, I believe so. Let me look under the microscope better. Yes. All right. So if we want to get really up close and personal, let's check these out. All right. So this is, we are zooming in on the first segment. This is the first abdominal segment right above or right, right above the last pair of legs and behind the coxy, that little circle, this little circle right here, that's the first spiracle on A1 or what we call the abdominal segment one. Um, we have this one that's on A3, A4, A5, Definitely on A1 through 5, the last abdominal segment might not. Yeah, I am, I am not seeing a spherical on the last abdominal segment, but if you look at it from this angle, we've got this one here, this one here, and then this segment doesn't have. And that's what we call, um, if you were ever like reading an insect key, right, we have, 
the thorax is broken up into T1, T2, and T3 for the segments of the thorax. And then the abdomen is broken up A1, A2, A3, depending on the segment. So I actually added too many segments on my guy. I made them too narrow. More like, more like this. Because he has, let's see, is that the case with all insects, with all hemiptera, also insects? Um, the insects always have, no problem, I love it. Um, insects always have their spiracles on their abdomen. Um, so it's always on the abdominal segments, but it's not always on every abdominal segment. Um, if we look at certain caterpillars, it'll be on like A1 and 2 and then A8 to 9, and they won't have any in the middle. Um, and then some, I feel like, I feel like I've seen grubs, like large scarab grubs that have large, larger spiracles along their abdomen but I'm not sure if it's on every segment. Insects like to break all of the rules, so even if we had a rule, I'm sure that there would be an insect that broke it. Like, all insects have six legs rule. There's definitely an insect that breaks it. You wanna see? It's right here. I'll show you real quick. This guy. This is a best beetle grub, so it's an immature stage of um, this beetle right here. This beetle likes to chew on wood. Ooh, can the number of spiracles change between metamorphosis? Yes! That's actually a wonderful question and runs me into actually forensic entomology. So if we're looking at maggot butts, um, a lot of times maggot butts kind of look like this. They're kind of roundy on the bottom and they can have some like phalanges on the top that make them look kind of like a weird face. And then um, <laughs> If you are a, um, if you are a first in star maggot, then you have one spiracle in the center of the at the center of the end of your abdomen, your uh, your maggot butt. All right, but if um, you are, but if you are a second in star, you have two spiracles, and they look kind of like this, and then you look like a really creepy face. And the same thing goes for third in stars. Don't mind, these are really fast, so don't mind the sketchiness of them. And so that shows all right, so this is first, second, and third in star maggot butts, all right? And this is what forensic entomologists are looking at. So if you're at a crime scene and they're like, you got to collect the maggots to determine time of death, all right? So they take those maggots to an entomologist, and that entomologist has to, one, determine what species it is, and two, determine what instar it is by looking at the butt. And then... Um, <laughs> and then uh, they can actually determine how old the maggots are, and equally they can kind of backtrack when the eggs would have been laid and when the time of death, when the approximate time of death was. Because flies are so good at laying their eggs pretty much immediately after death that um, we can guess within, you know, a half hour to an hour when those eggs were laid and when the, when the subject died. I did that for a, I did it for a forensic entomology class with pigs. It was quite interesting. All right. So... 
We have our cogwheel assassin bug from the lateral side, and I hope that you had the ability to kind of continue this on. I think that you can see pretty readily the rest of the characteristics. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to really quick, actually, if you want, I'll turn off my, and I'll show you what I'm doing. I accidentally knocked off a piece of my antenna when I was teaching. Um, so we're going to glue a piece of this antenna back on before we move on to our next insect. Let's see, where did I put my glue? We're going to glue it on if I can find my glue. There it is. All right. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever glued an insect back together, but the tips and tricks are... I always use Elmer's glue, but some people use like a craft tacky glue instead. Um, you do want it to be tacky. So I squeeze out a little bit of the glue and kind of let it sit on the edge like every art teacher ever has told you not to. Oh, what happened to the beetle without six legs? Sorry, Kim, I got um, distracted. Yes, so this is the adult beetle. It's called the best beetle, and it is... Uh, it's a really interesting beetle for a couple of reasons. One, it actually takes care of its young. And two, it has one of the most intricate communication systems out of all of the insects. It can make 14 unique noises, including like squeaks and bumps and chirps and those types of things. Well, this is the only insect that I know of that breaks the rule all insects have six legs because our friend right here, as a grub, as an immature, only has four legs. The, um, so you can see, let's see if I can grab my pointer. Um, right here we've got our first and second pair of legs, and then this third pair of legs just doesn't exist. You can see almost like there's a little nub back there, um, but it, doesn't exist. And actually, this insect was on one of my immature exams. Um, it was the first time I'd ever seen it. It's real crazy. And then you're like, all right, I'm teaching all of these people that all insects have six legs. And in the back of my head, I'm like, except the best beetle grubs. They have four. But, you know, when they become, when they become an adult, they do have six legs. So they gain that last pair of legs um, through their pupation. So at least all insects have six legs at some point in their life. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that's the story about bus beetles and their legs. Love them. All right, so um, I'm going to glue this antenna back on. And we have our glue that's just a little bit tacky now that we've let it sit a minute, so that's even better. Um, and then I, the only thing I have to do is kind of, well, I have to make sure I put it on the right way. Yep. And so I have kind of the little piece of antenna on my, on the uh, pin. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of roll this. onto the onto the end. And so um, I can fix it just a little bit, but this antenna is never going to be what it was. It's never going to be absolutely perfect, but it'll be good to at least keep the pieces together. And the good thing about Elmer's glue is that it dries clear. There. Perfect. Okay. So we got a lateral view sketched of our cogwheel assassin bug. But I wanted to show you what he looks like from the top down. Because um, not only does our cogwheel assassin bug 
have the cog on the top, he has these two kind of lateral spines on the edges of his cog. Um, those actually make for really great handles. So if you're ever collecting these guys, you can kind of pinch them by those two points and carry them around, and they can't bite you that way. So if you want to collect them and not get bit, you grab them by the pronotum here on the edges of the, sp of the uh, wheel. Um, then, moving on back, we have what they're named for. All right, so I'm going to sketch this, sketch this out really quick to kind of show you what I'm looking at. And so if we are looking at our cogwheel assassin bug, and I'm going to kind of turn the image in my head so that the spine, the wheel is going in this direction. So our wings are coming in this way and this way. All right, so essentially those are gonna be our wings and they're coming in and then we have these, these kind of the edges of the abdomen that are kind of expanded and then come back down. But that's a little bit more difficult to see right on a, on a lateral view, so we're just gonna do that really quick. All right, now with hemipterans, We have, we can actually break that down. So this is the order name, and hemi meaning half, and terra meaning wing. So they have what we call hemi elytra, where there's half of their wing is membranous, and half of their wing is leathery. So up here on the top, this is leathery and is kind of a, a it's kind of a, a, a thicker material, um, but it's also that darker brown area. So you can see this right here. That's going to be the leathery area of our wing. And then down here where you see kind of that coppery circle, that is actually a membranous portion of the wing. I might have spelled membranous wrong. It's a little bit late on my side of the country. Give me a minute. Yeah, it doesn't have an eye. All right, so that is, those are membranous wings, or they're a little bit thinner, and they have membranes. So if I activate this one more time and actually get these guys in focus, really, there we go. Look at what happens when I focus things. All right, you can actually see the venation in the wing, right? So if we're looking, looks like there's one that comes in this direction around, and then we've got another one that loops, and then we've got a loop that comes through, and then... Something very similar, oh, hey, forgot to turn on my camera for you guys. Um, something very similar to this where we have our membranes and then there's these veins right here. If I followed this, this line right here, this line right here, this one that kind of cuts it off, and then we have another one coming in this direction. And so that's what we sketched out there. And so this is going to be, this is going to be the dorsal view versus our lateral view up here. <laughs> lateral eye. All right, so my question to you out there hanging out and watching me is do, um, would we like to do another insect of your choice? Um, you can pick an order and I have most of the orders on hand. We could pick an insect out of this box because these are the ones I have available or I can dig into my collection. 
The Hemielytra, yeah! So, um, there are a couple of other... Here, I have one other example of a Hemielytra. So I can show you that guy. This is a stink bug. So he's a hemipteran. All right. And so if we are looking at our stink bug friend, this triangle here is the scutellum. So that's not a part of the wings. But this right here is a wing, and this right here is a wing. And if we look way down here in the back, this is part of the membranous part. And yeah, so it's clear in a couple of places, but it still, you're right, looks a lot like a fingerprint at different angles. Hi, Rosie. Ah, the dot's taking over. Don't let the dot take over. Yeah, we can do, we can do a beetle. Let's do this diving beetle's mouth part. Don't let me lose my labels. I've already lost one pair of labels tonight. I can I know what they look like but I want to get a good view from the front so that we can see sometimes it's a trick just getting the insect at the angle we want it let's start from this side Draw the head and the pieces that we can see, and then move to the bottom side. All right, so um, this is a diving beetle mouth part. And it is in the family Hydrophility. And so hydro, obviously, meaning water, and phility, meaning loving. These beetles are literally named water-loving beetles, and they're diving beetles, and they love it. So, um, if we are looking up at the front of, at, at the front of our head, um, we have, what am I going to call this? I'm going to call this a, kind of a dorsal view. It's kind of dorsal lateral, dorsal frontal. I don't know. All right. So we've got our eyes, these big compound eyes. Um, diving beetles have pretty, pretty intense compound eyes. Um, they have some really interesting adaptations when they are immature. Predaceous diving beetles, when they're babies, are called water tigers. And water tigers, um, let's, let's give you an example really quick. Their immatures hang upside down All right, so their immatures look a little bit like this, where this is the water's edge, and they've got their abdominal segments. They actually 
send up a snorkel so that they can breathe through their abdomen. And these um, large, uh, large mandibles actually can inject venom and drink their prey. So these are actually like long straws. But their eyes are really crazy because they can only see the equivalent of like two pixels high and very wide. So they're only looking at this much of an image at any point in time. And so when there is something like, I don't know, a mosquito pupa that is just going to be like that. I didn't draw it well. Um, if there's this mosquito pupa in the um, in the water, what these water tigers are gonna water tigers are gonna do is they actually will actively bounce in the water to scan their prey because they can only see these two pixels at a time. And so they have a very, very narrow eyesight this way. And they get to bounce all over the place. And so that's a little side on the, the naiad or the nymph. The immature, um, that's the immature diving beetle. Now, our guy, he's got these awesome big compound eyes. And if we look at after this line, right about, right about here, that, that's his upper lip. I believe it's called the labrum. Yeah. So this right here is the uh, essentially the upper lip, and it's called the labrum. And then if we're looking at the edges um, right here and right here, those are actually the mandibles. The right mandible is a little open, so you can kind of see it. The left mandible right here is kind of tucked into its head. So um, we can kind of do this, and normally they are kind of tucked in. So that would be it, the, what you can see of the mandible. And then the other mandible is kind of sticking out a little bit. So we might as well sketch it that way, right? Um, something like that. Wait a minute. Yeah, so the labrum is this upper lip, the mandible are these chewing parts. They also, have. let me see if I can zoom in enough. Super long labial palps that I guess we're just gonna have to see from the underside. Um, if you look right about here, this is where my, um, where my beetle's antenna are. Let's see. Yeah, so this right here is my insect's antenna. And if we wanted to, I know it's not a mouth part, but it's still connected to the head. And if we wanted to put it on there, it would be right here in between where the eye connects to the mandible. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, it looks like there's a series of small, almost circular segments that go up into something that's kind of more long and triangular, which is really cool. And it's got some hairs or seedy. Um, S-E-T-A-E -E is how you spell CD, and that's just what we call insect hairs. Um, and it looks like there's another one that comes out kind of wonky and big, and then it kind of ends. All right, so we've got this kind of awesome um, looking antenna, and what we're going to notice um, when we flip our guy over is that he has something that we call labial palps that are longer than his antenna. And that's going to be characteristic for the family. Yeah, right? Crazy information. I actually do have a whole YouTube video on water tigers. Um, if you wanted to check it out, it exists on the channel. Now there are a lot of things happening.
happening on the bottom side of this mouth. So we're going to try to take it apart piece by piece so that you can kind of see and understand what's happening here. That'll help a little bit. I also think he might have been chewing on something when he died. It looks like there's almost something in his mouth. Maybe those are just his labial, some of his palps. Maxillary palps, maybe. Okay. All right, so this was the top side. Now we're flipping our beetle over, and I'm going to put, I'm going to draw him kind of like we're seeing him so that his eyes and his mouth parts are facing this way, but then the underside of his mouth parts are going up because I think that that'll make kind of a cool, kind of a cool thing. All right, so the overall shape of the front of his mouth is going to be something something like this because we are looking at the bottom side of the labrum, right? And then we have, man, that might be a little better. I wish I could imagine this in my head a little better. Because his mouth part is kind of like a sandwich. Here. This is how I've had, had these guys described to me in the past. So we're going to go this way. We've got the labrum that's on the top, and then we have our mandibles that are on the side. And if we're making kind of like... Um, a uh, a diving beetle mouth part burger like a sandwich um the top the it goes labrum and then mandibles and then we have what we call the maxillary that is almost it's internal and with this guy is going to actually have two palpi. We're going to look a little closer. I'm just trying to sketch it out. All right. So then we have this like maxillary palpi. And then we have these very long labial palps. Palps are like mouth fingers. And then we have the labium, which is the bottom which is the bottom. All right. So if we are sketching it, we're going to draw it from the bottom up. So the labium is fairly small. It is right here. This angle right here, this is the lab the the labium or the bottom lip. And then moving up from there, we have what shows are a couple of these maxillary um, some of the segments of this maxillary, it's right about, it's right about here. Let's see if I zoom out a little bit. There we go. So it's right about here. And then above that, And then above that, we have these mandibles that come in. Man, I don't know if I've ever drawn a mouth part from the underneath like this. This is why we're practicing together, huh? Okay. All right, so if I was pointing these pieces out, this is the bottom lip, the labrum. 
this moving up here where there, you can see this and this, that's the maxillary and it has these palps, or so this finger coming out here and this finger coming out here. We also have All right, this is kind of what I wanted to show you. It's wild. Um, remember how long the antenna were, right? So the antenna go from about here to about here. Well, this mouth part has labial palps that are about double the length of the antenna. So this segment right here, and it continues all the way back here, that is a part of the mouth. All right, we call those we call those mouth fingers or labial palps, and that's what I was attempting. That's what I was attempting to to sketch with like the longer pieces. These are they're connected to the labium, I believe, and that's why they're called labial palps. But there's so much happening in this mouth part that it's kind of difficult to show all the little pieces. Yeah, can I label the maxillary? All right. So if we're making a sandwich, it goes labrum, mandible, maxillary, Labium. Yeah, so we've got the labrum at the top, the mandibles, the maxillary, and then the labium. And the maxillary, if we were looking at it, um, yeah, so I was trying to make kind of a sandwich. And I know that this maxillary kind of has an oddball shape, and I'm having a hard time seeing it on our, seeing it on our, on our, um, camera, but it's right, we're going to zoom in even further so I can show you. Yeah, it's like right in here. And it's sandwiched in between the mandible and the bottom lip. And ours has what look like two palpi on each side. And those palpi are actually going to help push um, food into the mouth part, right? So we kind of call them mouth fingers just because they do this up at the front of the mouth and they kind of help push things towards the mandibles and down the throat. They kind of help the eating process. Does that help with the labeling? I hope, Akshay. Alrighty. Perfect. So we've got a little bit of our diving beetle. Now this guy. Okay, good. Thank you. If we want to look at some fun characteristics and adaptations on our friend here, um, let's check. All 
All right, I'm going to show it for me to you from this angle just so you can see. You see right here, there's this little itty, itty bitty spine that looks almost like a spine. We're going to look at it. We're going to look at it from the ventral side. This is actually a keel. It's, um, if you were imagining it like on the bottom of a boat, it helps the hydrophilid, it helps the diving beetle um, control its swim. And so it can control the water underneath it. And if we flip it upside down to actually look at the entire keel, the keel starts The keel starts way up here between the first pair of legs and then continues all the way back through past the thorax and just a little bit into the abdomen. Now, it's only connected to the thorax, so where you saw that little spike, that's where the abdomen was. Um, and that is kind of this really cool keel on the bottom side of our insect that allows it to navigate in the water better. So if we were drawing just a really quick doop, 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 um, then we could say something like, the underside. Um, we could say something like the keel right here. And um, hydrophilids also have really, really fun. You would have computed for a beak, yeah. Um, K E E L. I am 90% sure. Yes. All right. Um, and then if we're looking at the hind legs, the hind legs are, of this guy are specifically adapted for swimming. So if we're looking at this leg, it's, um, the, this right about here is where the femur ends. This is the tibia. And then we go into the tarsi or the little toe section here. And on our tarsal segments right here, we actually have lots of little itty bitty law little itty bitty hairs. Those hairs can be very, very long or they can be kind of short but they do help the insect um, swim because they're kind of like an oar. Um, the, all, of those, all of those little hairs will help grab the water and it'll help kind of push them through. So if we wanted to sketch So if we wanted to sketch maybe a, a hind leg because they're cool You've got um, the coxy and then the femur and then this longer tibia and this is what you're looking at right here is this tibia with we call these a tibial spine. There are a variety of insects that have tibial spines from beetles like this guy through to a variety of hymenopterans or wasps, bees, wasps. Um, some of them will have tibial spines. And then moving through, we have a variety, a number of tarsal segments. It looks like the first segment is fairly long. This whole thing is segment one. And then two is just this part right here. Three is just this part. And then four with two claws at the end. So if we are sketching that out, it would be something like one. And then two, three, four. All getting narrower and narrower till you have two claws at the end. And those two little claws are called tarsal claws. Yeah, 
So that's a little bit about them. And then if we wanted to make sure that we have that adaptation going, we want to make sure that we have those long hairs. And those hairs are on both sides of the tibia. And that is what makes this leg a swimming leg. And let's see, the scientific name for that is NAD. Give me a minute. Natatorial. Right, so this is the, um, this is a swimming leg. The scientific name for having a swimming leg is natatorial. I had to Google it, but I got there eventually. Awesome, so we have our diving beetle, some sketches of the head with the pieces of the man with the pieces of the mouth parts. It was difficult to see them individually, but I'm happy that we were able to kind of pull it out and break it up into pieces for you. Um, we have to talk a little bit about the nymph and how they have to scan. Essentially, they have to bounce in the water to see their prey, which is kind of fun. Um, they've got this cool little keel and these hind legs that help them swim. Um, diving beetles are really interesting, and so now that it's, now that it's a little later at night, I feel like, I feel like we can talk about diving beetle mating habits, um, because it is quite interesting. Now, you'll see on this diving beetle right here, she has, um, she has this very, very smooth back, all right? And when, um, when, the, when the beetles are mating, the males are on top and the females are on bottom. Well, these beetles actually have to breathe um, air. They have to break the surface of the water to pick up air that stores underneath their elytra or underneath their hard wings. And so that's what they breathe from. And if the male takes too long, the female can actually suffocate during the process. So they, she doesn't want that to happen. That's not beneficial for anyone because eggs aren't getting laid if it takes too long. And so the females designed this really nice slick back so that they can get away as quick as possible, right? So that the guys have a harder time holding on to them. They became, they became slicker and slicker. Well, the guys also got a little tricky, and so um, a lot of times, so here's the thing, a lot of times in the natural world, when insects are adapting to mate, they're adapting pro-mating, right? So they're saying, hey, I want to be prettier so that someone will choose me, or hey, I want to make the best nest so that the girls will choose me. Well, in the diving beetles, they are actually adapting away from mating because of the, um, well, because of the percentage of death in the ladies is my guess, my assumption. Um, so the males, the males gained suction cups, all right? And so the males got these suction cups and they have the ability to suction cup their front legs to the hind, um, to the elytra. Um, well, the females ended up getting, uh, the females ended up getting a little bit trickier. And so not this specimen, this specimen looks like it was an older, but there are newer um, species that the females actually have striations or grooves in their elytra so that when the guys try and suction on, they can't suction, they can't grip because there are grooves. Um, and then I think that there are now a couple of species that the male's suction cups actually match the female's grooves so that they are actually kind of evolving together. But this is just a really kind of a fun story. I just wonder what the ladies will do next. I think that they should release some type of substance, like some type of, yeah, freaking suction cups. It's amazing. Yep. So, 
Um, that's my little bit of diving beetle mating history. <laughs> Well, we've been at this for about 80 minutes. How are you feeling? I don't... Oh, can you repeat why they don't want to mate? Yeah, they are um, adapting away from mating because the males are on the top. Here, I'll show you. Um, so when we've got these males... And they're suction cupped to the top of the lady, and then we have the water line. Well, he can breathe, but she cannot. All right? So she keeps adapting to not mate with him or to be able to get away from him quickly because um, he, if he takes too long, he suffocates her because she needs to breach the surface of the water. To breathe. Yeah. So the ladies are, are adapting away from mating because they want to survive and the males are the only thing they want is to start the next generation so they're adapting to try and get around you know the ladies slipping away. kind of wild. It's kind of a wild story. Um, because if we're looking at, maybe, let me check on my microscope, see if I can see it really quick. Uh, it's not going to be too evident. All right. So if we're looking at, let's see, I'll just show it to you this way. Um, doop, doop, doop. All right, so if this is my beetle's head down here, um, he has the elytra, or these first pair of wings, right? You can see them right here, this left wing and the right wing. Um, and so those are hard wing shells, but um, he actually has kind of a cavity or an open space underneath his wings that can store oxygen, that can store oxygen. So they'll go up to the top of the water and they will get an air bubble and they hold the air bubble under their wings and that's what allows them to dive, right? So they can swim underwater and dive, except they, they need to be able to breach the surface to breathe. There are a variety of other insects that, um, yeah, there are a variety of other insects that actually have, um, that actually have gills. And so they have the ability to breathe underwater for an infinite amount of time. It's just not the case with these guys. Yes, makes sense. See? <laughs> uh. I mean, anywhere in the anywhere in the animal kingdom, it's the male's job to spread their seed to as many females as possible, because then that gives their offspring the highest chance of survival. And so that's what nature's all about: is just surviving and and continuing the species, right? This was this this sketch was my a little quicker, but this was good. So we've been hanging out for about an hour and a half now. I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering how you're feeling if, um, I'm thinking if we're doing this every week, it would be okay. Uh, yes, Kim, I'm actually planning on doing this every Thursday. So welcome. You are actually here for our first, um, for our first weekly sketch. And so next Thursday at same time, um, we'll be doing this again. Uh, I hope that you guys come and check out my YouTube channel. Go and go and check out. I have um, a diving beetle mating wars video. I have a water tiger video. Um, and all types of other fun stuff if you want to go and check that out. I'm going to be in a documentary. It's called Bug Out. It's releasing on Amazon um, next month, early next month. 
And it's about the underground, it's above ground and underground bug trade. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing this again with everybody next week. Um, and we will, if you guys get here right, right when I start, then we can actually, you can pick which one we're doing. Best thing that's happened to you all week. Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. So I super, super enjoy sketching here. I'll show you really quick. I do two other sketches today with classes. The first ones, where are my other sketches? Oh, they're in the other book. Silly me. So I drew this IO moth with some high schoolers and we talked about the scales on their wings and we drew out a little leg to show off the pieces. And then we sketched out a little bumblebee with some wing venation and some fluff. Yeah, so those are some sketches I did. Um, and Uh, Akshay, thank you so much for asking. Um, if you want to donate to me and my, uh, and to my crazy loving in insect world where I go ahead and teach, um, my email is buggirl3216 at gmail, and that's connected to my PayPal. So if you wanted to donate, Akshay, you are more than welcome, and thank you so much for offering. So I look forward to seeing everybody next week, and I'll stick around for a couple more for a couple more minutes just to make sure no one has any questions, and then we'll sign off. All right. Perfect. I think we're all good. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. I look forward to seeing everyone next Thursday. Um, yeah. Come check out my channel. Subscribe. Hang out. Talk bugs. It's what we do.